Let's talk about balance. Why is balance so important in your life? Everywhere, in business, in your relationships, in your health, in everything that you do. You're listening to the Judo Mindset Podcast, where David Mills and Rahelios share with you tools to assist you in discovering your life of greatest inspiration and to help you live that life with joy, power, and intention. And so today, we're sitting here to talk about balance. I'm really excited to introduce you to David Mills. We have the great honor and pleasure of interviewing David today. He's a he's very busy individual, and we have a few minutes of his time here. Now, what you're about to hear is truly, it's a rags to riches story, first of all, but that's not the end. That's, that's really just the beginning of David's story. It's, he's got an incredible story to tell that's led to some really unique insights. And I've, I've known David for a short time now, and I've already learned so much, so, so much, and it's just the beginning. So I'm really excited to introduce David Mills and to have him kind of share a little of his background with you and really to explain where judo mindset podcast originated thank you roy uh that was a great uh, introduction there and a uh, great start to this podcast so you know um it's my my pleasure to be uh interviewed by you because to me you're the you're the man rahelio man <laughs> so, <laughs> well thank you and i've known you a long time in fact i was gonna tell you a little bit of uh when i first discovered you as a person I think uh, we were in high school. Um, I thought I saw you play the the uh, saxophone in a some kind of a talent show. Maybe yeah, is yeah, that right? Probably yeah, for sure. <laughs> I was like, man, this guy can jam. He's good. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've heard you play the saxophone since, though. Is the question? No, well, <laughs> yeah, I don't get a whole lot of, of chance to to play it anymore. Um, you know, the I'm, I'm mostly playing the bass guitar nowadays because everybody needs a bass player. Yeah. And the saxophone's kind of a luxury item. Oh, I see, you gotcha. <laughs> but I, I definitely <laughs> still love the saxophone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we've known each other for quite a few years, probably since the some mid '90s, maybe. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. You know, and I said in the beginning, I've I've only known you for a little while. I guess we've known each other since way back in high school. So we've known each other for a long time, but. Um, it's only recently that we started working together and I really got to know you because I didn't, I didn't really know your story or who you were or what you were about until just the recent past. And um, it's, it's really an inspirational story. I mean, you've kicked me in the butt big time. It's like <laughs> <you know? laughs> time to get going. And um, well, maybe we could start, if, you know, start with a, a little, as I mentioned, as kind of a rags to riches story. Um, David's very successful financially. He's got, I don't even know how many businesses you have, but uh, (laughs) I'm always discovering new things, but it didn't start out that way at all. Yeah, definitely uh, wasn't a, I don't know. I don't, I don't really call it a rags to riches because I I think money comes and goes Um, and money is kind of a a mindset. Um, The, some of the best times of my life has been uh, when I was poor, actually, (laughs) to be honest with you. Sometimes uh, the less stuff you have, the better, (laughs) but but I'll tell you, uh, um, so I started uh, my life out as a, a school teacher son. Uh, my, you know, you've read big you, money there. Yeah, school big money. Big, I think yeah. my dad was making uh, twelve thousand a year. Is was his uh, starting salary. Yeah, this was back in uh, probably the early or sorry, late seventies is probably when he started teaching. Uh, we thought, wow, you know, he's got a great job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but school teachers are. Uh, you know, they're amazing people. It's an important it's job. It's an important job for yeah. sure, but they're way I, didn't, underpaid. I didn't want to be a school teacher. I kind of grew up like, um, have you ever read the book uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Yes. Um, Robert Kiyosaki. Hopefully I said that right. Um, he lives in Scottsdale, by the way. Great guy. Um, so anyways, uh, my grandpa was wealthy. Uh, not with money, but wealthy with time. Okay. And my dad was always chasing, trying to earn some money. He was a school teacher. He was a professional photographer, 
back when photography was actually a, a business before digital cameras came out. <laughs> so everybody's a photographer <laughs> now. But uh, so uh, my my family, uh, I we started out in a single wide trailer, um, living uh, living off the land. Basically, my grandpa gave each of his kids uh, two and a half acres, and so they bought a, a single wide trailer. First memory I remember is looking at that single wide trailer, <laughs> and I'm like, man. Now that I think back at it, I was like, that wasn't a very nice place to live for sure. <laughs> but uh, they bought uh, this trailer while they built a home. Uh, my dad was a, a really handy man. In fact, that was kind of a, pr- probably a, a downfall to, to his uh, success as a person. or uh, Sorry, not as a person, as a, a businessman or as a someone with money. He always wanted to fix it himself. His time... He would always, he would either be working, teaching at the school, or he was fixing a car. You know, like when his spare time, he didn't have money to pay anybody to fix. You know, I remember him rebuilding an engine on a 1972 Ford that my grandpa drove, and he was rebuilding the engine. I'm like, you know, nowadays it's it's better just to buy a new car, you know, (laughs) but he didn't do that. He would fix them. And so he would. Anytime something was broken, he would fix it. He wouldn't hire anybody to fix anything. He was, I got this, I'm going to do it. But the nice thing about that is my, my grandpa, uh, he he worked for uh, Motorola as a machinist. And uh, he was comfortable as far as money goes. And he uh, he was a fix-it kind of guy too. But he, he was kind of my idol for business. He owned a bunch of different businesses. He owned a logging company. He was... A machinist for a while. He uh, he was a beekeeper, a welder, a farmer. Oh man, you can't even believe all the different things that he did. He was kind of a one of those guys that just loved to do everything. And my dad was there too, obviously, but he was always working, so he was he was around, but he was trying to provide for six kids, which was not as many as you have Roy but uh, <laughs> but still six kids is a lot and yeah plenty for so anyone <laughs> i have five myself but and you know it costs a lot of money to to raise children and so he was working you know his $12,000 a year job and trying to make it and so i kind of grew up as a you know definitely a school teacher's son so we we knew how to budget our money my mom was amazing at it she was you know you got to remember you know, on a school teacher budget that you got to stretch that dollar as far as you can. And so growing up, I think that's kind of what inspired me to, to be a businessman is actually, I didn't want to be a school teacher and I, and I love school teachers. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, they basically, I just saw my grandpa thrive in different businesses and different things that he did as a cattle rancher. He was, you know, you name it. We learned all kinds of stuff from him. And, uh, it was a, a, a neat life actually to live the way he did. And he had all this time and all this things that he did. It was really, he was really creative. He was, he was always dreaming something and him and my dad would sit around and watch the, the alfalfa grow on our, on his farm and, <laughs> you know, dream about different businesses and different things that they were going to do. And it maybe inspired me to be a, a businessman, but I don't know. I guess that's kind of where I started out. So. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, hearing about that that background, you've you've really held on to that because it's Dave. As I say, he's he's got, I don't know how many businesses again, but you'd never know. Uh, he's the most down to earth guy. Just really mellow. He's not the guy. He's not the guy with wearing jewelry, driving a fancy car. He could if he wanted to. But uh, I guess you'd rather spend your money on other things. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and, and I know a little bit about your, well, your, your professional background. I mean, you, you were telling me you started out picking up garbage. Yeah, <laughs> actually, lots. I did. <laughs> so uh, so um, one of the things before, so I graduated high school. Uh, uh, before I graduated, actually, I'll go back a little bit. I, I, I had another couple of idols in my life of business. I don't know. I, I don't know. I guess I shouldn't call them idols. I don't know. Maybe that's a bad term, but mentors. Mentors, yeah, yeah mentors. <laughs> so, uh, my uncle uh, Bill Melzer, which uh, passed away not too long ago, uh, um, he owned a, a string of businesses across the uh, Navajo Nation, and he, um, 
I worked for him uh, through high school for or a couple of years through high school, and then I also worked for one of my other uncles in a logging business, um, uh, Steve Reedhead, out in uh, for a company called TriStar Logging. And I, I realized at that point during the logging experience, I didn't want to be a logger. <laughs> it was like we'd come home just completely covered in dirt, you know, from head to toe. Um, mm-hmm. I was a high school kid, and I thought, wow, this is not this is not for me. I don't want to be a logger. It was cool. You know, they had a lot of cool equipment, you know, running around the woods, picking up logs and things like that. But it's, it was yeah. something I didn't want to do. So I worked for my uncle, uh, or my other uncle for a couple of summers and he was a, a great mentor, uh, taught me a lot about business. Uh, and, uh, so after that I, I went, uh, I went on a mission for the, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I was a missionary. You've seen those guys with the white T-shirts and little black name tag yeah. riding their bike around the helmet, and sweating their rears off out there. <laughs> but uh, the thing yeah. that that I thought was really cool is um, when I went to the training center to, for them to train me. They taught me how to sell, and uh, right. I, I t- I've told you this before, this story, but. Uh, they, they go through this program, and these guys know exactly what they're doing. They know how to teach people how to sell because they're selling religion, basically. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're going door-to-door. I don't know if – I did a little bit of door-to-door sales when I, yeah. when I was younger, you know, selling candy bars and stuff as a kid. And, uh, yeah, that's – that's I couldn't even sell a candy bar. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I could yeah. sell one. I'd work on it. Mean, I'd go like a week, <laughs> you know, knock it on doors. <laughs> Maybe I sold one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. if you want to learn how to sell, become a Mormon missionary. <laughs> They'll teach you exactly <laughs> how. But that's one of the things that we actually are going to teach you guys is uh, how to sell too in the future and uh, in in future you know uh, episodes or or even some classes that we've got coming. So, anyways, uh, so they taught me how to sell. Went and knocked on doors for two years in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, served in the sticks out in the country, right in the middle of the city. Uh, different places like that. I learned a lot. It was one of those experiences I, would, I wouldn't trade for anything. It changed my life. It really did. Yeah. Number one, I mean, I, I've got to give uh, everything I have to to God. I mean, He's He's blessed me with many, many things, and I I'm very grateful for that. And I think that's probably one of the key things and with being successful of, as, as a person is to give give your you know credit the credit for uh, the blessings that we have to to God. I really believe in that 100. Nice. I mean, he's he's blessed us, and it and, and I think he gives us opportunities and blesses us in many ways. So, anyways, I went on a mission, and then I I came home, and I when I came home, I had found out the uncle that owned the stores. Um, and I'll tell this story because he's dead now, and I can't. So <laughs> he got caught um, um, embezzling money, oh, geez. and so uh, his partners. Uh, they basically didn't want to put him in jail because they liked him a lot, but he was embezzling a lot of money, and so they basically kicked him out of this business, which yeah. uh, is the day they kicked him out is the day the business has failed. He was the glue that kind of held, held everything together. Oh, jeez. And so they every single one of the stores failed and went out of business. But as as I was gone on my mission in Atlanta, this happened, and you know I heard about it from my parents. We, all we could do is write. We didn't have. Uh, we could only call on Mother's Day and Christmas. When oh, I, uh, <laughs> all we did is write in letters. This is before cell phones and all that. Um, so because they didn't want you to get distracted. I or, guess. Yeah, yeah. It's just. I mean, it's totally like, different focus. nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> focused. Yeah, you gotta go go knock those doors, man. <laughs> you don't want to be thinking about anything at home. So, so uh, yeah. I uh, when I got home, my uncle had kind of rebuilt himself. Uh, over the two years that he that I was gone, and uh, he had picked up a bunch of uh, landscaping jobs where he was mowing mowing lawns and cleaning up parking lots for commercial properties. And uh, so I got home um, and moved to Phoenix and got a job for, with him picking up trash in parking lots in the middle of the night. And so um, I would I would go. Woo-hoo. Oh man, it was it was great fun. <laughs> so it was one of those things, you know. But I needed the money. I didn't have have a job. And then um, as I was doing that, I found another job with a, another cousin that gave me a job in the real estate appraising business. And so I'd do that. I'd go clean parking lots all night. And I'd go to school at uh, Mace Community College all day or for 
part of the morning and then I'd go to go to work at my the appraisal company and then uh so then I'd just do that over and over again it was a grind I mean just grind yeah. so during that time I got married too and um I don't know if uh if you've heard this story Roy but it's kind of a fun one but when I got married my wife was like hey I want to go clean parking lots with you I'm like, no, 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 you don't, you don't want to do that. It's dirty. You know, you're picking up cigarette butts. You're it's, it's nasty. I mean, there's diapers run over in the road, green burritos that look like a tire tread. I mean, you name it. I mean, this thing is like, she, she must've thought you were, yeah, that was pretty cool though, that you're like a garbage picker I guess. upper guy. Well, she's she's like, I'm going to marry this guy and I'm going to help him <laughs> pick up garbage. I don't think she knew that I picked up garbage when I was dating her. You, you didn't lead with that. Uh, no, right? I did. I did not lead with that. So. Anyway, so she came with me one night, and uh, actually, my wife is quite brilliant. She's like, why don't you do this with rollerblades? Oh. And so we got rollerblades, and we started doing it with rollerblades. So we had, you know, those little picker-up sticks? Oh, and yeah. We'd yeah. have a bucket and a pickup stick with, you know, you squeeze, and it squeezes together. Yeah, yeah. So we were cruising around on rollerblades, picking up trash. It actually made our time go way faster. It was a ge- genius idea. <laughs> and so I was able to, like, kind of, like, almost double... Uh, or like cut my time in half on cleaning the parking lots, but it was, I don't know. I think I made maybe like two or three hundred dollars a month doing that. It wasn't a lot, but yeah. But I was making, I think I was making eight bucks an hour at the, um, the appraisal business, so it wasn't a lot either. Of course, it was a lot to me because I was selling religion for two years and I didn't, <laughs> they didn't pay us anything. Right. <laughs> so, you you pay for that? Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, and, and I shouldn't say selling religion. I I do. Uh, love my religion they're great people and uh it's a beautiful beautiful people so anyways um uh, so i basically uh started doing that and then I, I um i started doing real estate and i started doing that more and more and i got more involved in that and uh, the appraisal business and uh, i eventually uh, got my real estate license during that same time as well and i got hired on by a property management company um, a, a guy named Tom Caldwell, a genius uh, real estate guy, and uh, him and his uh, business partner, Brett Brewer, they're both from my hometown, and they hired me, and they, they said, we'll pay you 3000 a month, and I thought I'd just hit the jackpot. I was like 20-something years old, you know, 25 or something, and yeah, yeah. getting paid three grand a month. That was way more than my dad was making, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so... I was like, yeah, cha-ching, I just hit the jackpot. So I quit cleaning up parking lots, (laughs) which was a blessing, (laughs) and uh, started selling real estate and doing property management. And I was still doing appraising, too, at the same time, kind of. I've always had two jobs. I've never not had two jobs or two businesses at the same time in my whole life, probably. Wow. So anyways, that's kind of how I got started in the real estate business is is that. And, And what was cool is those guys paid for me to get my license which is really neat to i didn't have that much money and they sent me to the real estate school and um, got my license and just a just a great bunch of guys to work with and they taught me how to sell um, real estate because i knew how to sell you know the the church taught me how to sell right yeah yeah. (laughs) so so i went and uh i started selling in fact we sold so many homes that they they made me stop because they, what they were doing is they were managing that we would sell a home and then we would put it into the rental pool and we had like a thousand homes that were vacant <laughs> and they were like and what happened is the company would guarantee the buy, the buyers if they were vacant that they would pay their mortgage and we had like a thousand homes sitting out there that were just empty because like we sold yeah. so many homes <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so, yeah. It was great money though, and they started paying me a thousand dollars a home, and sometimes I could sell, you know, twenty homes a month. Wow! And so I, at that time, I I dropped out of school, and my father-in-law was like, kind of pulled me aside, and my wife and everybody was like, "You can't drop out of school," and I was like, "Dude." I'm making 20 grand a month here <laughs> yeah, right. and I'm like 25 years old. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It was like amazing money. And, uh, so I dropped out of school, which was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, honestly. <laughs> and I, oh, yeah. and I, and I don't, uh, you know, I, I like school and I think college is for certain people, but 
it was it gave me the uh, opportunity to start my own businesses up and do things like that where I wasn't able you know if I would have gone to school I would have I would have got a bachelor's degree to um, to get a job and well that's that's I don't, I don't really want a job right I mean that's what school essentially is for so you could figure out what you're gonna do to make money and clearly you were already uh, had that covered yeah yeah for sure of course uh things change and the market kind of turned a little bit and i i could see it coming um so i i got out of the business and it wasn't a very smart financial thing for me to do but i knew that that couldn't last it was it was something that was gonna be like hey this isn't gonna last for too long so i got out of that business and i went back into the appraisal business which turned out to be a really good thing for me um, learned a lot about commercial real estate um, we appraised uh, trailer parks rv parks hotels ranches um, you name it car washes anything from anything that was commercial um, industrial buildings and uh, one of my mentors uh uh, Jan Sell and uh, Doug Estes, those guys taught me everything they knew about real estate and appraising, which was a huge, huge thing to have. I mean, these guys were in the business forever. They were old. Well, Doug wasn't that old, but he, would, he had been in the business quite some time. And Jan was, he'd been in the business for 30 or 40 years, something like that. And so he taught me everything they knew. I mean, it was a great, the best education I could ever a ask for and it was and they paid me to do it yeah. which was amazing so nice. so I, I worked for a couple different companies and a guy uh kirk Kleinman uh, with ks appraisal um he was he was a great mentor my i, I got to work with my brother which was great too uh, so those guys uh, really taught me a lot and which actually was a springboard into like my later things later in life which was something that i that the education that I learned from that was invaluable. Um, in 2008, um, I was I was as high as it, high as you could get, man. You I was making a ton of money. Um, and we know what happened in 2008 is the uh, the real estate market crashed. Mm -hmm. So I went from uh, making a lot of money. I won't even tell you how much I made. It's it's crazy. But you, I went from that. And um, appraising though. Real At estate appraising, time. yeah, mm -hmm. I was doing appraising, and so the nice thing about commercial appraising is we were making anywhere from three to ten thousand dollars in appraisal, wow. and I could do ten or twelve of those a month. Yeah, so yeah. it was really good money. And and <clears throat> and you don't really have to sell in that. No, situation. well, you kind of do. You do. Um, so you've got to you've got to be pretty personable, you know, because you're you're going in front of like a lot of business owners and people that uh that have have businesses and they've got a lot of a lot of things going oh my stomach's growling man <laughs> I thought it was a but i did i did go eat and so finally <laughs> i ate lunch finally at six o'clock at night <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. anyways uh so the market crashed um and i was really dumb with money because i grew up with none i mean i was poor we we would the only money we had when we were kids is what my grandpa would pay us to catch gophers on his farm and he'd give us a dollar per gopher tail. <laughs> and so I didn't know how to manage money. And I kind of just got into this business and started making all this money. And I was doing stupid things like I bought airplanes, <laughs> yeah. cars, trucks. I mean, I was do I was, and I was buying some real estate assets, but not very much. I was mostly buying toys. I was doing really dumb stuff like, you know, wasting money. And so you learned how to fly in there. So I did. Yeah. I'm a pilot. Yeah. So I learned how to fly, which actually helped my business quite a bit with uh, the appraisal businesses. I would be able to fly to say like Bullhead city and uh, do an appraisal there, fly to Flagstaff, do one there and then fly home. And I'd be home for dinner, <laughs> wow. which was great. Cause I couldn't, you can't drive that far. It's like, you know, 12, 15 hour day of driving. So yeah. Anyway, so I did. That was awesome. I got to learn to fly. Um, we've crashed a few airplanes. Those are, those are for <laughs> stories for another day. <laughs> so, you, how do you you crash a few airplanes? Like, well, I did actually personally crash yeah. them, but I let somebody borrow my plane and they crashed it. And then my dad actually crashed my first airplane that I owned. But anyways, that and, was and lived through it and lived through it. Yeah, everybody lived. Everybody was okay. But 
Jeez. Airplanes didn't make it, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, the uh, where was I at? Um, 2008, the mm. market crashed, mm. and my wife's like, "Oh, hey, let's buy a new house." <laughs> right. So I went and bought a new house, which was at the time was I thought was crazy expensive. It was like three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I thought, "Oh my gosh, I just bought a three hundred fifty thousand dollar house." <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't remember what my payment was. It was a lot, but. Anyways, for the time, it was a lot. So I had all this debt. I bought, I had financed all this stuff. So I financed airplanes, trucks, you name it. I mean, I was, I had all kinds of stuff. Mini Cooper, my wife went and bought <laughs> Chevy Tall, you name it, like yeah. brand new, everything. Yeah. Stupid. That was the dumbest thing I could have done. Anyway, so uh, 2008 was a pretty good year, actually, for us because the, the banks would hire us to appraise uh, all the bad assets. So I thought, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, I'm on top of the world. 2009, 2010 came. Boom. Income went from way high to like maybe like $2,000 a month. Boom. Overnight. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Like I have all, I think I had to make like $15,000 a month in payments. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, I'm a, up a creek, you know, bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I ended up uh, liquidating everything and uh, selling out everything. I even had my truck repoed. Was it was nice. bad. It was a bad time. I was really dumb with money. <laughs> so, <laughs> wasn't good. So uh, so Dave went from uh, rock star to, to rags, man, overnight. And I'm like, what am I going to do here? Nobody was hiring. Couldn't give anything away. I mean, I sold. I had an auction. Um, I had, I had, I had developed a subdivision during that time too. And I had, I had about 15 lots and the, uh, the bank called me up one day and we were still making the payment. Um, they called me up. We had, we borrowed like 600 grand. Um, and the bank called me up and said, Hey, you're, we're going to call your note. We need you to pay it off, which I had, I had borrowed 600 grand. I paid them down to like 30 grand. Oh, wow. So I almost had it paid off. Huh. And I still had about 15 lots maybe or something left. I can't remember how many lots we had left, but um, they're like, we need you to pay your $30,000 by like like next week or something oh, or like 30 days. I yeah. can't remember. It was like super quick time frame. Like, dude, I don't have any money at all. I'm like, my truck just got repoed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, I'm like, I don't have a dime here. So I, I had a buddy that was an auctioneer and he, he, uh, I called him up and I said, Hey, uh, can you come, uh, do an auction for us? And I've got like, I think I had 12 lots actually is what I had left. And, and they were paid, almost paid for. And I need to pay the bank like 30 grand. Cause they were like, they were beating on the door. And I'm like, I've been making my payment. Cause the payment was pretty cheap by that time. Yeah, well, you'd, pay, they're like, you'd already paid them 500. And... I know they still <laughs> yeah. want their money. <laughs> they were trying to get rid of everything. They, cause the FDIC was taking over banks. It was bad. It was like, everybody was scared. They, were, they didn't want to get shut down. Yeah. So anyways, um, I, my, my friend had a, uh, my friend was an auctioneer. So we had a, a big auction and I had advertised this thing everywhere and nobody, nobody wanted real estate at the time. It was like, you couldn't even give it away. So the auction uh, day came, and uh, guess how many people showed up, Roy? Or Rogelio. Sorry, <laughs> man. I keep calling you Roy. Hey, that's, but... <laughs> yeah, all my friends and family have known me as Roy my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, guess yeah. how many people showed up to the auction? <laughs> 20. Nope. Two. <laughs> Two <laughs> people. Two people showed up to the auction. That's <laughs> not an auction. I was about to cry, man. <laughs> I was like, no, no. So th my friend said, hey. All it takes is two people to have an auction. And he was right. So I was like, all right. So we started the bidding out uh, on these lots. And, and guess what? These two guys bought every one of those lots. <laughs> every single one. They were like, they were like ten thousand dollars is all that's all we could get at the auction right there but they bought every one of them and were they like fighting with each yeah, other they were go, go, yeah they were going back go. well he started them at like a thousand dollars or something you know like <laughs> and we had a reserve we told them hey we if we don't get like 30 grand for these things we're not going to sell it but anyways they got we got we got it bid up and they paid i think 10 to twelve thousand per lot which was giving it away they were worth forty thousand at you know, when 
you know, at the, when the mm -hmm. market was good. So, so anyways, I, I sold every single one of those lots. It kind of bailed me out and it, that nice. kind of gave me a little bit of boost. You know, I went and bought a 1968 uh, Ford F100 that just barely ran <laughs> for 500 bucks. And so I had a brand, I had, I went from a brand new truck. It was a, a brand new GMC Sierra to a 1968 Ford. And, uh, and I, I was like, uh, I sold my airplane to my dad. I mean, I, I was getting rid I had to liquidate everything, yeah. everything, even my house. I sold, uh, for nothing. I gave it away. Uh, um, anyway, so time goes on trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Um, I decided to start up a property management company. We couldn't sell any homes, but we could rent them. Everybody wanted a rental because they just lost their home. So I was like, great. So I found a little niche. So I, I got in that groove and I went from zero homes. Well, I had like a couple of my own rental homes that I kept, I held on to. I didn't have any equity in them, but they were at least bringing in some rental income. So um, I sold my, uh, a couple other things and kind of just made it by, but I, I, I made enough money to start up a property management company, went from my own couple homes to like a hundred over like overnight. Like we had about a hundred homes going and guess who was the maintenance guy? <laughs> Me. <Yeah>. Anytime somebody <laughs> needed maintenance, I'm out there fixing it. So Gra you, just dra dragging through the dirt, man. I'm, yeah. You're plunging toilets and plunging yeah. toilets, fixing, I'm fixing everything. <laughs> In fact, when the phone would ring for maintenance, I'd be like, I'm there because we didn't have any money. Our, you know, like we could bill the owner, you know, some money for fixing the toilet or whatever was wrong. Somebody oh. melted a microwave down. They <laughs> oh, caught geez. the kitchen on fire. So I had to rebuild the kitchen, you know, oh, stuff like that. And so, I mean, I was, I was like, I'd come home just exhausted every night. You know, it went from this really nice white collar job making a ton of money to the maintenance man overnight and uh i remember uh -huh. i was so broke that i i had bought like i'd always wore a buckle jeans when i was when i was making a lot of money and i was they were expensive you know they're a hundred something dollar jean mm. and uh my buckle jeans were completely worn out holes in them and i would i would i got a sewing machine from my mother-in-law that was in her basement and i would sew patches in them and my pants look like patchwork, you know, like <laughs> I'd take like plaid shirts yeah. and I'd put a patch in the knee and they kind of look cool. I thought they were kind of cool. I think I could started that. Trend. I know I probably did. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I, my jeans were just completely falling apart. I mean, it was just bad, so, but at least we, we started growing the business and I grew, grew, grew. And then, uh, one day the market started changing and I, I got back into, I started doing construction, so um, I I had known a friend that had a bunch of money, and uh, went to his house and said, "Hey, can I borrow? Um, I don't know, it was like a hundred grand." And he's like, "Sure. When do you want it?" I said, "Right now." <laughs> he's like, "All right." So he's like, "Well, wow. I, I do uh, draws." So he he did it, set it up into different draws. So you, you do the foundation, he give you some money, or he give you a little bit up front, and the, so I went and built a home. Uh, I didn't have any idea how to build a home, but I called my dad up and I said, Hey, will you teach me how to build? He said, yeah, I'd love to. So we, my dad and I built this home together. We built every, we did everything. So you're, you're swinging the hammer. You yeah. You like hire yeah. some people. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, man, I just hit the jackpot. Cause I just, I got a little bit of money coming in. And when I was building homes like that, I had some money. So I went and I sold my uh, 68 Ford and I bought a 88 Ford F350 <laughs> four door long bed. I mean, this <laughs> thing was ugly. <laughs> it was a beast. But you're moving back up. In I'm the moving world. back up. So, <laughs> so anyways, uh, so I sold the, uh, that truck, bought a new truck, and it was my new construction rig. And I was like, dude, I'm a home builder now, you know. <laughs> yeah. So then I partnered with uh, with my old partner that I had with the, the we built those did those lots with and started building some houses, which was a dumb idea, but at least, at least, <laughs> at least I had some money coming in. <laughs> so started building houses and that took a long time to kind of rebuild after that. It was hard uh, going from riches to rags. Over, you know, it took a lo <laughs> lot of years to rebuild that. And so, um, I started, um, 
selling real estate again and uh that was actually the only thing profitable building looks like it's profitable but you always just rolling that money into the next one to the next one and I actually found out we were losing money doing that too and so i got out of that mm-hmm. um but anyways kind of a kind of a good learning experience for me to go kind of be humbled i was kind of uh arrogant and maybe um not as grateful during that time when I was making a lot of money and um, that crash really humbled me, made me thankful for what I had. And actually it was kind of a relief to get rid of all that stuff because I didn't have any payments. You know, 88 Ford, they're not going to give you money for an 88 Ford at the bank. You know, they're they're like, yeah, this thing's a piece of crap. (laughs) So so, uh, anyways, I think I paid like three grand for that truck, but it's, uh, it was a good experience for me to learn and to be humble and try to just regroup and re, you know, kind of reboot of my life. And, um, a bunch of other things happened during that time. Uh, I think maybe one of the things that I'd maybe like to say is I, when I lost everything, I kind of got depressed for a while too. I went, went through a depression and, um, that was hard to just kind of, uh, not necessarily like a midlife crisis, but just a depression of like, I just lost all this stuff. And it was, it was kind of hard actually for me to, cause I, I like my stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. I think we all do. Well, then did you stay married through that? Yeah. Yeah. My wife stuck with me through the whole time. We're still married. Oh, nice. <laughs> She's still with me. So <laughs> 24 years now. Hey, that's so, a good one. Yeah. I mean, it was tough. I mean, we went through, through a hard time and, you know, we were in the thick of little kids too at that time. So she was kind of occupied on taking care of kids. And yeah. I was out there grinding away, doing maintenance work for the property management company. And um, as the market recovered, I, I uh, sold my, my uh, property management company. And I didn't make a lot on it, but it gave me a little bit of money to kind of do what I wanted to do to the next step. And um, anyways, during that whole time, there's a lot of other things that went on during that time, but we probably don't have time for all that. <laughs> so, the, uh, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you don't want to hear yeah. all the, all the hard stuff. <laughs> so, I remember one time, um, uh, oh yeah, that's what happened. I forgot about that is, uh, I had a, a friend, uh, or actually my wife's cousin, I, I, I want to say something. It's not what you know, it's who you know, I think, in this th- life. it's Sometimes it's not what you know at all, it's just who you know. Because I, I had a lot of people that helped me out, to, and I really appreciate those people. But I had a, my wife's cousin started buying foreclosures. And so he would buy them and pay for them, and then we would go in and fix them up. And I was in maintenance mode, fix-up mode, construction dude mode. So yeah. um so I would go in there and fix these homes up and then I had my real estate license. So I'd turn around and sell them, which we would get our money back for the fix up and then I'd make a commission on it. And so that kind of changed things around as I was doing that things got better Then, you know, it started climbing back up, you know, slowly. Yeah. But the problem was, is he was buying so many homes. You could buy these homes for nothing. They were giving them away. Um, but the, uh, the hard part was I had to come up with the money for the repairs to fix them up. And he was buying like 10 or 12 of these a month sometimes. Oh man. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Like I don't have, <laughs> I don't have this money, but I kind of hung in there and kept doing it. And I, you know, I borrowed a little bit of money here and there, which I shouldn't have done, but it helped me to kind of get over that edge. And so I, um, that that gravy train lasted for a little while, and then it went away. And then we started building some new homes. Uh, that was a big mistake. We were we lost <laughs> lost a lot of money in building homes. Kind of got in the market too soon. Uh, we probably should have waited another couple of years. But so I built the business, uh, you know, a construction business up, and then that was extremely stressful. Like having all these guys, huge payroll, all these people to deal with and stuff. And so. Um, Anyways, uh, about, um, maybe about a, maybe six months after I got out of, I stopped doing construction and just started selling real estate, which was kind of a hard transition for me, but it, but it was a good transition. But about it, about six months after I'd sold my business, I was just stressed. I, I didn't really sell it. I kind of just gave it away cause we were losing money. 
and uh, I say I sold it, but I really didn't. It was kind of the best day of my life, really, when I got rid of it. <laughs> so um, about six months after that, I, I um, um, my son um, and I went to a, a horse camp. I'm a, I'm a I'm a cowboy by trade, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, I grew up as a cowboy, so our family's always had horses. And nice. so I went to this uh, this horse camp where we spent three days with I spent three days with my son, and uh, we basically learned how to do cutting horses, where you you take a cow and the you, you weed out the cows that the one you want, and you put them, you know, you can move that one cow around, and then the rest of them stay. There. Anyways, I went through this training and learned a lot from that. And um, on uh, Sunday, the 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 training was over, and I went home and uh, I was sitting on my couch on Sunday morning, and uh, I didn't feel very good. So I um, was kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden, my my mouth I just started drooling, and I was like feeling my face and going, "Man, what the crap? I'm drooling, and I can't." control it and then my arms went numb and i was like "Uh oh something's wrong so i, I got Jeez. up and i went to the bathroom i'm um, standing there by the sink kind of just looking in the mirror at myself and i i was i i had a toilet paper and i was like wiping my mouth up i couldn't swallow it. and then all of a sudden uh, my world just went black completely black and i ba- i blacked out and i fell straight yeah. backwards just dead weight my whole body fell and hit the hit the ground dead weight my head hit the edge of the shower oh. and split my head open but a thud and my wife came running in there oh my gosh oh my gosh what's wrong so i uh i was completely out of it and i was kind of trying to get up and uh so I, my wife and son helped me up and got me on the couch and they're like dude you're having a stroke and i was like i didn't know I didn't know what a stroke really was, <laughs> but, uh, so anyways, before I know it, I'm in an ambulance going to the hospital and, uh, kind of came to, you know, a little bit more in the ambulance. I was cracking jokes with the ambulance driver, <laughs> you know, I, which I knew, you know, I knew I grew up with him and stuff, you know, okay. but, um, anyways, I, I end up in, in, I'm in the hospital and, uh, there are, they're fixing my head up because it was split open and the guy's like taking a stapler to my head you know, oh, wham, you know? <laughs> and uh he's like dude you you know like hold still you know i was trying to move you know i was trying to stay still and stuff but my wife's like i think you had a stroke and the, the hospital didn't believe me oh because they didn't know what they, they what didn't know they didn't point. know they thought you just fell and cracked your head yeah and... the guy in the emergency room's like oh no dude you're fine you know and over the next couple of days my my entire left side of my body went uh, paralyzed. It took yeah. like almost two days, and but after, after I was in the hospital for a week, and um, so so it was still whatever blockage was in there was it was still in there. Well, I don't or, know. I I think but, it cleared out actually. It, it cleared out, but the paralysis took a little while to happen. It kind of set in slowly, and the only thing I could do is move my shoulder, so I could yeah. lift my shoulder up. That's it. Yeah. And so my hand was dead. My leg was near dead. And uh, so, uh, and then if you've ever had a stroke, don't, don't. <laughs> it's not fun. No, so, I haven't. <laughs> so, I, hope, I hope I don't. Yeah, don't have a stroke. So anyways, I spent a There's week, a great piece of advice yeah, for you yeah. all right there. From, <laughs> wisdom from Dave. <laughs> Thanks, man. So uh, I had a stroke, and uh, they, I, I was like, dude, I've got to get out of this hospital. I was going crazy. So they, uh, they let me go home. But um, So they realized you'd had a stroke by then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, yeah, they like, put me through all the tests and did all the scans, and they're like, yep, he had a stroke. And it was not a, like a little one. It was, pretty mi- it was not a mild stroke. It was like a major stroke. Yeah. But what had happened is the stroke had uh, damaged my heart, and so – uh, my heart, uh, my, if you know anything about hearts, my ejection fraction, the ejection fraction is basically how much heart, how much blood your heart pumps. And so, you you know, a normal yeah. person is about 50 to 60 percent. And so it's not 100 percent. Nobody's ever at 100 percent. So 50 to 60 percent is about a normal ejection fraction. 
Uh, now runners and different, you know, marathon people can get higher than that. But the, uh, my heart was at my ejection fraction was at five percent. That's so practically dead. Yeah, I was just barely <laughs> hanging on. So they did let me go home, but they made me go home with uh, what they call a life vest. And so it was, it's like this battery pack with this like electronic bra that basically <laughs> strap around your chest. <laughs> and, uh, it, if your heart fails, it, it'll shark you back to life. And so it's like the paddles just built in. Yeah. You're wearing just, them it's just the paddles built in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so here I am paralyzed on my left side while carrying this, uh, life vest thing around. And I couldn't button my pants anymore. I couldn't, you know, because your my hand didn't work. Yeah. Can't tie my shoes. I, I, my leg kind of started coming back after like a really short time, so I was able to like stand up and maybe take a few steps. And so, um, it was it was quite uh, quite a humbling experience. And so. And 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 you, were, I mean, how old were you at that time? Um, I was forty. 41 i mean that's like way too young to have a stroke i know and you don't smoke you don't drink no, uh-uh. you don't i don't you know yeah. you, you're a, yeah. you look like a healthy guy i thought it was healthy man <laughs> i don't even know what, they don't they're not even sure what happened i think what happened is i got dehydrated from this horse camp and i got a blood clot because i was really dehydrated but anyways so i it took me about um i'd say about six months of really trying really hard and they were going to put me in a uh, rehab facility in phoenix and so i could get get better faster and but um when they sent the paperwork into the rehab place they said um we're not going to take you your your uh your heart's too bad we're not we're not we're not gonna let you walk on our walking machines or anything because you might die right here. We don't want you to die in here. You couldn't even qualify for rehab. <laughs> no, I couldn't qualify for rehab. They're Jeez. like, so they were pretty much go home and die basically. Oh man! And then the cardiologist and everybody that I was working with at that at the local hospital, they were like, you know, you're you're gonna die basically. <laughs> kind of thing. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> And so, say, thanks for the vote of confidence. Yeah, guys. they're like, go home, you know, bring your your chest, you know, your your defibrillator that's strapped on you, and if it goes off, then you know, come back or whatever. But <laughs> they didn't have a lot of confidence in in uh, in my life. So, Man. I mean, they they didn't uh, necessarily come out and say that, but that that's kind of what they said, you know, in a sh- <laughs> short amount of words. Um, so, anyways, I was like, I'm gonna get better. I'm going to get better. I, I feel good. I'm going to get better. And and I felt like crap, yeah. but my mind felt good. Okay. Yeah. And it changed my mind, the stroke. It really did. Um, one of the prob- one of the things that it did do is it, I couldn't taste anymore. Not like COVID taste. It, it changed my taste. So everything had tasted different. Like I had to relearn what everything tasted like. Chicken tasted like death. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. I'm like, this is disgusting. What is it? <laughs> I mean, everything. Everything yeah. smelled different. Like yeah. shampoo, the smell of shampoo was disgusting. Oh, anything geez. artificial flavor, you know, anything like that was just horrible. So it was hard to eat. It's crazy. Plus, I had to relearn how to swallow. You know, and chew like you know, it was like really hard to swallow. I choke on my food, and you name it. So, Jeez. um, that was tough. And then uh, just trying to move around, and you know, I had to have my wife put my clothes on, button my pants. You know, like it was tough. So I spent about yeah. six months of of time just trying to recover. And um, about six months later, I was able to walk around pretty good, but. Before that, I couldn't even sit up. Like it, it ruined like the core strength in my like my stomach and all my my back muscles. Uh. So, um, like just sitting up and sitting in place, I couldn't even do it. So like like about a month or two after, uh, my wife took me to a restaurant, and I couldn't sit there. Like I just couldn't sit up. Like I was like I have got to get back in the, the car. Cause I couldn't sit up. Like it was just, it just hurt like that much. 
But anyways, six months later, so, yeah, I'm working you're hard. You're definitely not doing any construction or anything no, during no, all that time. No, no construction. <laughs> I still was selling real estate from my chair. <laughs> oh, really? I hardly told anybody that I had a stroke, but oh, I, my speech was messed up, and I worked really hard at that because my voice was my job. You know, and they were, the people were just like, "Oh, Dave's been drinking." Sounds like <laughs> <laughs> I know. I really did. I talked with a bad, bad lisp. Um, anyways, that that was a tough thing to learn how to to like control my voice. The bad thing is that um, I did like to sing, and for you, this would be bad. Imagine losing all of your pitch and tone. Oh man, yeah, everything just completely flat. It's... Like can't sing, can't carry a tune. All monotone. And, and you played guitar too. And right? I did play the guitar for most of my life, and a lot. I can't, you couldn't play that. I still can't. Yeah. I, it's just still hard. But yeah. I've got most of my emotion back in my hand, but the strength's still still coming. But and that's it's been a couple of years. But um, anyway, so um, one of my friends, uh, 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 Dallin Weir, was. Uh, uh, who I he was renting an office space from us, and I try to go in the office as much as I could during this time to show presence, you know, that I'm around, that I'm, yeah, because I still had a ton of like I was selling real estate, had a ton of listings, Jeez. and so yeah. people were like, kind of, you know, hey, make sure you sell my property, which the market was amazing at the time, so I was selling a lot of real estate. Which it, you didn't tell your clients like I just had a stroke. Um, if I need an excuse, I would, but <laughs> most of them I didn't tell. Like and so, it was there that way. They were like, "Hey, we don't want to use him. Oh, you right, know, like yeah. you don't want to tell everybody you like just we, about died." We you feel know? really bad for you, but we need to sell our house, and I don't think you're <laughs> gonna cut it. So. I remember the first <laughs> appointment I went to as a, a home listing. I my wife was with me, and I could barely sit up, like. And I was, I was like, I got back in the car and I was like, just wiped out for the rest of the day. Like it could, that was all I could do. Mm-hmm. And they knew something was up with me, but I, you know, I, I did tell those people, I was like, yeah, I just, I had a stroke not too long ago. And they're like, man, you shouldn't be here probably. But I was like, I'm determined. My doctors are telling me I'm going to die any minute, but I figured that I'm going to at least sell one more house. <laughs> so, exactly. But uh, anyways, uh, one of my friends, uh, Dallin, um, he uh, he he called me up and was like, "Hey, are you good enough to travel?" I was like, "Yeah, man, I I can travel." He's I was like, "What's up?" He's like, "I'm going to the uh, country of Georgia." I'm like, what, Georgia? "You mean the state?" No. <laughs> He's like, "No, the country." I was like, "Yeah, I, I lived in the state of Georgia." He's like, "No, no, no, this is over by Russia and stuff." <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyways, so. I was like, well, what are you going there for? He's like, I don't know. I just want to go check it out. What, really? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like. Uh, but he closed his eyes and just like, I'm going to go there. <laughs> yeah, pretty, oh, where is it? Yeah, oh, pretty much. <laughs> so so he, he's like, do you want to come with me? And I was like, um, I don't know if I can do that right now. But he's like, he's like, uh, just try, man. Just try. He's like, I was like, all right. So I spent a couple months like working out and just kind of like doing doing everything i could and and i was going to the gym like the gym took me you know they took my 50 bucks a month <laughs> the rehab wouldn't take it <laughs> no no the they gym's wouldn't. like yeah you can die here we got yeah. a disclaimer it's like, <laughs> exactly. yeah. sign right here <laughs> yeah. i didn't tell them <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. i've been i was working out quite a bit you know I, I could lift like maybe i could squeeze like five pounds and lift that and curl it and so that's all I could do is five pounds. <laughs> all right. So, but at least I could do that. So you're using the pink weights. Yeah. So I was using the pink weights. People would look at me in the gym. <laughs> I'd be like, you know, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. They're just like these dudes what lifting like, <laughs> like these big old dumbbells, you know, big old buff dudes. <laughs> like that guy. I was like, I had a stroke, and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you had to tell. I them, had to right? tell the guys yeah. in the gym. <laughs> 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 Uh, most most people knew because uh, it's a small town where we live. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, "Dang man, you're doing good, go go." <laughs> no, there's a lot of people with a lot of encouragement there. But um, so, anyways, I, I get myself better to go to Georgia, and I yeah. I go I go to Georgia with him, and, and it was exhausting. You know, it took us like 36 hours to get there. 
Man. I mean, it was like a long, the, long the flight. Long. Yeah, we missed a flight, and oh, I mean, man. we had to we had to go to Germany, and the next flight out of Paris was like thirty days, and it was oh. a, it was a big deal. It took us a long time to get there, but anyway, so we finally made it, and um, I had never been anywhere like that before. I I've been to Mexico and Hawaii, but I've never been anywhere else. I mean, I've been a lot of places in the U.S., but yeah. it was like really like life changing for me to go see these people and mingle with those people, try their food, try their culture. Uh, just just an amazing people. Just super loving, kind-hearted people. Uh, people have been kind of beat up for years or caught between Russia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and there's been all these wars and stuff over there. Just such a nice people. They were very loving and welcoming, and their food was amazing. And uh, it actually tasted really good by that time. Oh, okay. So, so food was tasting was good by that. Yeah, normal. yeah. I was like, mm, this is good. They, they ate a lot of bread and cheese too. It's just yeah. good. Who but it, like, you didn't have a a plan. It, it sounds like like you just like let's just go to Georgia and yeah. Then what? Like just we just roamed around we had no we had no plan it was the best thing ever <laughs> no itinerary i met the coolest people though because they when you don't have an itinerary you're not checking boxes off and you're not going place to place to place and so we spent uh, a couple weeks there and it was just a cool cool experience like and it was yeah. great great therapy for me because uh Dallin's like 20 years old you know oh. he's like 22 or something yeah. And he's like, dude, let's go ride bird scooters. And I'm like, I can't even freaking hold on to the thing. So I was riding a bird scooter in Georgia. I barely could do it, you know. Like, Great therapy, though. And so, and it was probably cheaper than the rehab place. He's, he's right? like, if you're going to die, you're going to die having yeah, fun. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of had this mentality just like that. I was like, hey, I might die any moment now, you know. Like, they told me I was going to die. You yeah. Know? So. I was like, I'm not going to die. I'm just going to keep living life the best I can. So I, I basically uh, just was living life, my best life. It was like, it was awesome. And so it was actually like one of the coolest things that could ever happen to you is to live like you're dying. I mean, shoot, man. Mm. The country song, Live Like You're Dying, is <laughs> there, there's no joke. It's It was, it was awesome. And some people are like, man, I can't believe you had a stroke. But I was like, man, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It changed my entire outlook on life. Like I was way, way more thankful, way more grateful. Even though I'd had some experiences in the past, this really, truly made me grateful. Made me thankful for um, a working body. People that have disabilities made me way more aware of that. You know, because, you know, when you can't do certain things it's um it's really hard this world is not designed for people with disability and uh made me really aware of that and made me more compassionate and more kind and you know you know definitely uh, looking out for people that have disabilities a lot more and, and just 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 completely changed everything the other mm -hmm. thing that happened too is it, it like basically rewired my brain and so what I was looking for, so I started traveling. This was like, man, this was a blast. So I started traveling. I've been all to all these places. I just kept going and traveling and it was great therapy. And one of the things that I was kind of trying to find when I was uh, traveling is like, what motivates these people? What motivates me? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? And the thing that, that I, that I found that motivates people all over the world is uh, hope and faith. Those two things. Hmm. When that's what motivates everybody is hope and faith. Wait, I mean, were you kind of interviewing people or you're just kind of no, observing or just observing? Yeah. 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 Just observing. And those two things, cause everybody everywhere, we're all the same. We're all humans. And, I know there's a lot of prejudice out there and a lot of people that don't like other people in different places and different different countries or even different towns. Hmm. Um, they might not like their neighbor. But the thing that I found is if we actually sat down with each other and break bread and eat together and talk, we have a lot in common. We really do. Oh, yeah. It's just 
we really we really are humans all of us no matter what color you are no matter what religion you are no matter what background you come from we really are all human beings and we all bleed we all we all have feelings emotions and we all have desires and things that that drive us and and what drives people is hope and faith and um, those kind of things really that's really what kind of inspired me to um to to find uh to find balance and the thing that i that i learned is well as i was as i was working my tail off for most of my life i realized that that's not really what's that important money's not important um the time that we have and the the people that we have in our lives are what's important and now there's two sides of this you can be really off balance you can have uh overworked with lots of money or you can be broke with lots of time what mm. what what the most happy time in my life was and has been is where i was balanced like having the balance right in the middle of those two things you don't want to be broke because you got a lot of time yeah. you don't want to be rich because you don't have time right being in the middle is where it's at and that's the where i've been the most happy yeah well and you know People generally that, that are struggling financially tend to think if I had more money, I'd have more time. Like right. they feel stressed, like always trying to make ends meet, barely making it. And it's like, wow, you know, that's why people, oh, if I could just win the lottery, then I'd have time. Right. I, I yeah. want to, you know, make, get a better job. Then I'll have more time. I, you know, yeah. go into business for myself so I could have more time. No, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think, I think the, the, ba- the, the trick is to find the balance is be be right in the middle is you want to be comfortable you want to have enough money to pay your bills and have have investments and things like that but if you spend too much time you never see your family you lose your health if you're broke you have tons of time and you're sitting around maybe twiddling your thumbs i don't know (laughs) um i just really find that finding balance is really where it's at yeah i guess i mean maybe that's that's where you need, I think we all need to be. <laughs> it's finding balance. And that's a right. very hard thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Very hard. Well, it, the, the thing about balance is that at that point of balance, it becomes almost effortless, right? Because if you're falling over to one side, I mean, even physically, you could, you know, you have to pull yourself back the other way. If you're falling to the left side, you got to pull back the other way. Right. But when you're straight up and down, Yep. It's, it's it doesn't require a lot of effort. And unless unless you have a stroke and you fall over. <laughs> 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 you don't want to do that, trust me. It, yeah. So But you're right though. Yeah, straight up and down, balanced. Our bodies are meant to be balanced. And when we get uh too much, if you drink too much, if you do drugs or you do you work too much, you don't drink enough water or you you could drink too much water. I mean, there's all these things that that can make your life off balance and uh it's really difficult and i think if we can find that balance then our lives can be way better at least mine has been anyway when i found when i figured that out it took yeah. me took me a bunch of punches in the face and a stroke to figure that out <laughs> but it's a it's a beautiful thing once you find it yeah wow well yeah, what a what a story, and it sounds like uh, you've lived already ten lifetimes. Well, <laughs> I feel old right now, so. <laughs> but <laughs> I got a long ways to go. I think yeah. uh, I think uh, having a good attitude about um, about what happened to me was probably key, and and I think that's probably a really important thing in life is to have a good attitude. If if I would have like stayed home, and, and I'll tell you what actually happened. Um, when I went, I, I, I had to go get a heart surgery. Um, I got rid of the life vest and I went and got a pacemaker defibrillator installed in my, in my chest oh, here. And, uh, my heart doctor actually is really inspiring. He's a, uh, his family's from India and, uh, Dr. Chirikari, amazing man. Um, amazing heart doctor, a cardiologist. He, he, he pulled me aside and he says, Dave, you're way too young to die. 
if you sit down in your chair and do nothing, you're going to die. And he says, if you get up and move around and, and exercise, your heart's a muscle. He's like, I know when you have a, what you have, your heart is damaged to a certain extent, but your heart, it can get better. And he's like, you go after it. You go live your best life, and you're going to do amazing. And I believed him, and it made all the difference. I'm glad I changed heart doctors because <laughs> the other yeah. one said, go home and die. So, <laughs> no joke. Yeah. It really, it really inspired me. He's, he, uh, his, uh, advice couldn't have been better. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's incredible, you know? And so as I started now working with Dave and, and we've been talking, uh, you know, realizing our two different backgrounds and completely different backgrounds leading to very similar philosophies uh, to bring you that balance in life where, where you feel good in your family life you feel good in your in your you know your physical body you feel good in your your financial situation um, you feel inspired every day to do what you're doing and um we were talking about well let's let's share this wisdom with people and that's that's where the the judo mindset has come about where where dave is has this principle of balance finding it and applying it to all the different areas of life in a way that's extremely beneficial makes it easier exactly <laughs> And that's what that's what uh, when I came up with the uh, the concept of the judo mindset is that we the in the the martial arts of judo is all about balance and uh, putting out uh, having balance with uh, minimal effort, right? Yeah. You you probably know the the saying better than I do. I can't remember the what is it. Ju oh. uh, minimal effort, and then what was the other one? Well, yes, there's the, the, the principle of balance of maximum efficiency. Oh, that's right. Minimal maximum. effort. Yeah. And then in mutual um, benefit. All right. Yeah. Maximum efficiency with minimal effort. That's that's the goal anyway, right? Absolutely. Balance, you know, all those things. Yeah, so I couldn't remember that. My brain's kind of stroked out sometimes. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, we've put some really good things together for you, and we're and we're working on even more. So definitely uh, keep in touch. Uh, go to the judomindset.com. You can sign up there for a free newsletter that we're going to begin sending out soon, where you're going to get more information, knowledge, and and this judo mindset podcast will continue with uh, where we're going to share. Lots of uh, fun things to help you have a good life. I'm excited. I think it's important to, to, to find that balance and to find that judo mindset. It'll change your life. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm really uh, grateful again for your time here, Dave. I've, I've had a, a, a difficult time pinning this guy down for, for five minutes. <laughs> 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 yeah. and that's no joke. So um, when we get to hear from Dave it's always a, a good thing so. yeah thank you Roy appreciate you man and you inspire me as well so you're you're an inspiration in my life oh well I want to I want to hear your story next thank you're you. next <laughs> uh, all right we'll do that well you've been listening to the judo mindset podcast with David Mills and Rahelios, and we'll be talking again soon all right that's a wrap <laughs>